Welcome back. I thought you'd given up on our heroes. Oh no. I was only saying... Really? You want to know more? Well then, have a seat and I'll continue where we left off. Chapter 8 On the nearby rooftop, Shanta watched the black sedan drive away from the school. Quickly she transformed and followed. Leaping from roof to roof was nothing for her as she stealthily tailed the sedan. Suddenly, a nearby neon sign began shining brightly. Shanta shielded her eyes from the intense light. The light faded. Shanta looked down at the street. No sign of the sedan. Shanta smirked. They sensed my presence from this distance. Looks like I'm up against some strong people. Head to my place ASAP, Madame Renee said. What for? Shanta asked. Now's the time to meet the other members, Madame Renee answered. You all must train in order to beat the true enemy. Shanta nodded as she headed for the fortune house. Mark woke up to the sound of Andrew's voice. He sat up and looked around the gym. Even William was there. What happened? Mark asked. He looked at William. Where's Tracy and Rosa? William hung his head low. They got captured. Andrew answered in a low voice. Mark was pissed. Oh, hell no! Andrew clenched his fist tightly. If only we were stronger. I can help you with that. A familiar voice said. It's the old lady who gave us our powers, replied Mark. Watch your mouth, Madame Renee exclaimed angrily. She calmed down. You need training. Those men you fought are four times stronger than you two. You boys need to train using the interdimensional gateway. What the hell is that? Andrew asked. You'll know soon enough, she answered. Her voice vanished. Mark and Andrew stared at the ceiling for a moment before they looked at each other. William cleared his throat. Who are you two talking to? He asked with a raised eyebrow. The lady that gave us our powers, Mark answered. Anyway, you should go home where it's safe. Mark's right, Andrew chimed in. From here on out, this matter involves only Mark and I. William didn't like the sound of that. However, he understood the situation and trusted both Andrew and Mark. Just be careful, William said before leaving the gym. Moments later, Mark realized where they were heading. Great, just what I need to go back to her little pet shop of horrors, Mark said sarcastically. Andrew chuckled and said sarcastically, Do you want me to hold your hand? I ain't scared. All right, Mark replied. Come on, fierce warrior, let's go to the fortune house. Andrew said, helping Mark up from off the floor. The Metamorphic Five drove up to Hideshi's hideout with both Rosa and Tracy gagged and blindfolded. The security guard let the guys in. He quickly phoned Hideshi of their arrival. Excellent, Hideshi said with a grin. Hideshi put down the phone and waited for them to walk in his office. A few minutes later the door opened. The metamorphic five formed a straight line in front of Hideshi. We have defeated those kids, sir, Big C said. And we brought you guests. <clears throat> well, this is great news, 
Idishi said smiling. Uh, what should we do with them? Big C asked. Lock them up for now? He answered. He looked at Rose and Tracy with an evil grin saying, I have big plans for them. <gasps> Mark and Andrew arrived at the Fortune House. They walked in looking like two bums begging for money. Their clothes were torn, their bodies ached, and they were tired. Madame Renee gave Mark and Andrew new clothes, like the ones they had on and fed them food. As they ate, Madame Renee explained to them what the interdimensional gateway was, and why they had to use it. So we're going to another planet to train? Andrew asked, trying to understand all of this. What, are we in some kind of anime cliché? Mark asked sarcastically. I don't understand your question, Mark. Madame Renee answered. But no, you will train there for three months. Three months! Mark shouted. We don't have that much time to train. By then, Rosa and Tracy would be dead. Three months in their time is equivalent to nine days and hours. Madame Renee explained calmly. You will have plenty of time to rescue the girls. Where is this place? Andrew asked. On the planet Maku, 30 light years away from Earth, she answered. The planet is divided into five huge regions. You will stay with the Neptons in the central region of the continent, known as the Forest Region. They are a strong, friendly race that live like the ancient Japanese. Even their language is exactly like the Japanese, except for their dialect. A good way to view their dialect is a New Yorker speaking Japanese. They can teach you how to master your powers. Also, I have taught them many of our Earth customs. You might be surprised to see what they have learned. What about our parents? Mark asked. They're going to know we're gone. Not to worry, I have already taken care of it. Madame Renee answered. Even William has helped out on the matter. Hope so, he said folding his arms. When do we leave? Andrew asked. In four hours, she answered. Get some rest, you guys need it. Madame Renee led them upstairs to her spare rooms in a huge attic. Mark and Andrew picked a room, jumped into the bed, and drifted off to sleep. Four hours later, Madame Renee woke them up. She quickly prepared the gateway. The gateway was a huge stony circle with zodiac symbols that hung a few inches above the ground. Madame Renee had to place a small ramp in front of the gateway for Mark and Andrew to walk through it. As they came downstairs into the basement, they saw another person standing next to her. Mark's eyes widened as he realized who it was. I can't believe she's here, Mark said smiling. Who is it? Andrew asked. Shanta, my cousin, he replied. Sup, cuz? Shanta exclaimed as she hugged Mark. She looked at Andrew asking. Who's this guy? Oh, that's Andrew, my homie. You can call him Drew. So I heard you can metamorph too. And here, I thought I was the only one in our family who could. Mark and Andrew's mouths dropped. You can metamorph too? Andrew asked. Yeah, I metamorph into Kikuni, the Japanese fox. She answered. Does auntie and uncle know? Asked Mark. Just my mom. Shanta answered. Mom was there when I received it. But she doesn't like it, even to this day. Although, she told my dad that the tattoo on my thigh was a birthmark. So that's why you always wore shorts to the pool or the beach? Mark replied with a surprised look. And here I thought- Enough with the chit chat. You guys have work to do. Madame Renee interrupted, staring at the open gateway. She's right, we have to train hard in order to defeat those guys, Andrew said. Then let's kick some ass, Mark shouted as he walked through the gateway. Wait up, yo! Andrew exclaimed, following behind. I'll take care of them, Shanta said to Madame Renee before walking through the gateway. 
We have to get out of here. Rosa said, staring at a small window in a large room. Don't worry, replied Tracy. Andrew and Mark will save us. I know it. Rosa smiled a little as she stared at the floor. She thought about Andrew for a moment and how she nearly kissed him. Her face grew hot. Rosa couldn't believe she was falling in love with Andrew, the guy who used to take baths with her and always needed her protection when they were kids. She stared at the crescent moon from the small window for a moment. Please be safe. Beast of the Bronx Mark Shanta and Andrew arrived on Planet Maku within seconds. They stood there in awe, looking at their surroundings. This was a beautiful planet. It was like the rainforest on Earth, but lusher. There were unknown animals of different sizes, colors, and species. The water was crystal clear and was filled with sea life. Even the fruits here looked different. So where do we start? Andrew asked, looking for a clear path. Over there, Shanta answered, pointing to a path going into a forest. As they walked through the dense forest, red eyes popped everywhere. Even though they were scared, they kept their faces composed. Suddenly, a huge creature jumped in front of them. It was a creature that was part reptile and part human. It had a Komodo dragon's head, green scales, bulging muscles, and a tail with spikes at the end of it. What the hell is that? Andrew asked with his eyes wide open. I don't know and I don't want to find out. Mark answered with his eyes wide open. Shanta shook her head. Boys, guess I'll get rid of it. White light illuminated the forest. Even the creature had to shield his eyes. The light faded. Both Mark and Andrew's mouths dropped. It was their first time seeing Shanta in her were-fox form. Shanta jumped into the air. She crossed her arms over her chest as she smirked. Needle storm! She shouted as she stretched out her arms. A hailstorm of white energy came crashing down onto the creature. A smoke cloud filled the air. Shanta landed onto the ground, thinking the creature was destroyed. The smoke cleared, but the creature was still standing. The creature opened his mouth and lashed out his tongue at Shanta. Shanta dodged an attack. Mark and Andrew knew she was in trouble. They both transformed, giving her a helping hand. Striking claw! Andrew shouted. Shadow Fang! Mark shouted. Both of their attacks knocked the creature backwards. They bumped fists. The creature got up, lashing out his tongue at them. They all dodged, watching as a tree turned into dust. We have to cut that tongue, replied Shanta. How? Andrew asked. Someone has to be a decoy while the other two cut the tongue, she answered. You ain't getting me to do it, replied Ma. You know my people don't mess with animals in the wild. <laughs> Andrew raised his eyebrow. You are so pathetic. Andrew sighed as he dashed towards the creature. He punched it in the face. The creature stepped backwards. It used its spiky tail to smack Andrew into a tree. The creature opened its mouth, lashing out its tongue at Andrew. Andrew shut his eyes. Slash! The sound of Slice's tongue filled Andrew's ears. The creature screamed in pain. Andrew opened his eyes, staring at the decapitated tongue. Hey Drew, wanna finish the job? Asked Chanta. Oh, yeah! Andrew exclaimed as he rose to his feet. He dashed forward to the wounded creature with his glowing claw. Striking claw! Andrew shouted as he thrust his claw through its body. Blood squirted everywhere. Andrew pulled his claw out of the creature's body, watching the creature fall to the ground. Andrew flicked the blood off his claw before he de-transformed. He walked over to them. 
That was tight, Drew. Mark said, bumping fists with Andrew. I agree, but we have to find the Neptons, replied Shanta. Suddenly, a small <laughs> giggle echoed in the trees. They looked around, trying to pinpoint the sound. Out of the trees came a small boy wearing a dark blue sleeveless garment. He had a small face with huge eyes, a small nose and an innocent smile. His black hair was in a ponytail with small bangs that covered his forehead. Aw, oh, he's so cute, replied Shanta waving at him. Yeah, but what's up with the spots on his cheeks and arms? Asked Mark, pointed out. You trying to be a cheater or something? The small boy ran towards Mark, hugging his leg. Aw, oh, he likes you, Andrew said sarcastically. I see, Mark mumbled. Maybe he can help us find the other Nebtons. Andrew replied, looking at the small boy. The small boy spoke to them in Japanese. Andrew didn't know what he was saying, but the small boy kept on pointing towards the path. I think he wants us to follow him down the path, Andrew said, looking at both Mark and Shanta. The small boy grabbed Mark's hand, signaling him to follow. Lead the way, kid, Mark said. As they walked down the path, the forest started to clear. Rays of sunshine poked through the dense trees. They exited the forest. Their mouths dropped in awe. This place is beautiful, replied Shanta with a smile. Standing in front of them was a huge stony temple with an area of about 80,000 acres. Suddenly, a crowd of Nebtans surrounded them. Some stared at them while others talked amongst themselves. Welcome friends, a voice said from the crowds, stepping forward. Wow, he's hot, exclaimed Shanta with her eyes wide open. Down, girl, Mark said, trying to act cool. My name is Ching. I'm king of the forest region, he replied. Welcome to my kingdom. Say what? Andrew exclaimed. Jing was a handsome young man, around the same age as our heroes. He was an inch taller than Andrew, and was toned. He had short black hair with small bangs, a long face, dark brown eyes, and a smile that seemed to twinkle whenever he smiled. Ching wore a black garment like what ancient Japanese Buddhist priests used to wear. His crown was thin and circular, with a large red diamond in the center. I know I'm young, but I'm the only male in my family to take the throne, he said. You know why we're here, right? Andrew asked. Yes, Madam Renee told me everything, said Ching. So we will help you in every way we can. He smiled. Instantly, his mouth twinkled. Is his mouth supposed to do that? Mark whispered to Andrew. I don't know. Andrew answered, shrugging his shoulders. Thank you for your kindness, Shanta said, holding Ching's hand. Let me know how I can repay you. That's Mark enough, grabbed guys. Shanta's Ouch. ear and pulled her away. Ching stood there, baffled. You'll have to excuse them, Andrew said, feeling embarrassed. Ching led them into the temple where the Nebtans lived. Many of Ching's servant girls, who were wearing short sleeve kimonos, smiled at Mark and Andrew. They giggled amongst themselves. Of course, Mark enjoyed the attention. Yo, Drew, these cheetah girls love us, man, he said, grabbing Andrew's shoulder. Don't you have a girl? Andrew shot back. Remember her? I do remember Tracy, Mark replied with a sigh. He looked at Andrew and grinned. What, are you afraid of losing Rosa to a girl from another planet? Andrew's face felt flushed. Rosa and I are just friends. Mark gave Andrew a look that said he was lying. These are the guest rooms. You are welcome to choose any room you would like to stay in, Ching said. My servants will call you for lunch in 30 minutes. Ching left. Mark and Andrew chose the rooms next to each other while Shanta chose the room across from them. The rooms were amazing. Every bed was made from oak trees and draped in silk cloth. 
the floors were made of black marble. There was a closet in the upper right-hand corner filled with garments of different colors. Over the bed was a huge tapestry of a dragon. The walls were made of stone with a small window on the left side of the bed. Andrew went into the closet and pulled out a blue garment from off the rack. He noticed a drawer at the bottom of the closet. He pulled it open and found several pairs of moccasins. Andrew changed his clothes and put his earth clothes into the closet. Suddenly a knock came upon the door. Andrew opened the door. One of the servant girls was standing before him. She signaled him to follow her to the dining hall. She kept on looking back at Andrew, smiling and giggling as they walked. This girl was hot, but Andrew couldn't stop thinking about Rosa. They arrived at the dining hall. Both Mark and Shanta were already eating. What took you? Mark asked, and ate a piece of meat. I was just admiring my room. Andrew answered as he sat down next to him. Another servant girl came out of the kitchen and brought Andrew his food. Even though Andrew didn't recognize anything on his plate, the food smelled good. He grabbed his fork and knife and dug in. His eyes widened as the taste reminded him of steak and chicken. Andrew wolfed down his food since he hadn't eaten for nearly half the day. The food was delicious, Andrew said, rubbing his stomach. I'm glad you like it, replied Ching. Uh, Ching, I got a question, said Mark. What is it? Why do the children and servant girls have spots on their cheeks and arms? With our race, every child, boy or girl, is born with spots all over them. The spots symbolize our connection with animals and how we are one and the same. Unlike your planet, we do not see ourselves as superior beings. We treat everything with respect and equality. I believe you call it animism. So, what happened to your spots? Asked Shanta. My spots vanished when I turned 16, he answered. Males lose their spots around the age of 16, while females keep theirs. Their spots change from black to blue at age 14. When that happens, the males must find a bride. Many of the women here have changed their spot color, but not one I like. Why? I don't want to marry someone that I don't love or understand. Shanta Smith. Beast of the Bronx. After lunch, Ching showed them around the temple. There this are so many rooms within the temple, even and Ching didn't know what some of the rooms were. What caught Andrew's attention was the courtyard. It was about the size of three football fields. There were trees planted everywhere, and the grass was lush and green. The courtyard reminded Andrew of Central Park, only it was cleaner and had no muggers. As Ching continued the tour, Andrew noticed two young girls. One was wearing a purple kimono, and the other was wearing a light blue kimono. They were walking towards the courtyard. Ching ran towards them. Minutes later, he brought them over to Ma, Shanta, and Andrew. These are my sisters, Hibika and Aya, he said introducing them. Hibika was the older of the two sisters, being younger to Ching by a year. Even though Andrew had just met her, her aura reminded him of Rosa. She was the same height as Andrew, had long black hair, dark brown eyes, and wore a purple kimono. Aya was the younger sister. Even though she was 16, she looked like she was in middle school. Aya was two inches shorter than Andrew, had long black hair in pigtails, and dark brown eyes. Of course, Aya was wearing a light blue kimono. My name is Andrew. Andrew replied introducing himself. And this is Mark and next to him is Shanta. It is nice to meet you all. Abika said in a sweet voice. Would you like to join us with our tour around the temple? Asked Mark. I'd love to. She answered sweetly. 
watching? Did you show them the garden yet? Ai Ya asked in a babyish voice. Not yet, Ching answered. We're heading over there now. You're going to love our garden. Ai Ya replied to them. Ma Shanta and Andrew were amazed at the size of the garden. The garden was in a dome-shaped greenhouse behind the courtyard. Most of the men worked here in order to keep the temple's food supply in stock. Inside were trees filled with fruits, various plants and strange vegetables. One Mequon tree was filled with blue-green swirled fruit that tasted like apples. Of course, Mark was interested in the Makwan vegetables, particularly the orange lettuce. As you can see, some of our fruits and vegetables taste like yours, replied Ching, picking up a Neptune fruit. He looked at Shanta. Would you like to try it? I'd love to, answered Shanta, taking the fruit from Ching's hand gently. Shanta bit into the fruit and began to blush. This is the best fruit I've ever tasted, she said with her hand on her cheek. Ching smiled. Another twinkle came out of his mouth. Wish my mouth could do that, Mark whispered to Andrew. The tour concluded with dinner. Once again, Andrew didn't recognize anything on his plate. Hungry, he wolfed it down and asked for seconds. Even he, Bika, was amazed. Mark, on the other hand, tried to eat his food but felt a pair of eyes staring at him. He looked through his periphery, noticing Aya silently gawking at him. Nervous, he managed to finish his plate. Of course, Chanta continued to talk to Ching, asking him about Maku and his people. If you go by Earth's time, we are ten years older than we appear, Ching explained. We Nebtans age very slowly. Shanta was intrigued. Is it because of your DNA, or something else? Both, actually. Our DNA makes us age slowly by about seven years. But according to our Nebton scientists, the fruits and vegetables we consume also have an anti-aging compound in them, slowing our aging by another three years. So, if my friends and I continue to consume your food, would we also slow down our aging? Ching rubbed his chin. I'm not sure, but I guess it's worth experimenting. Shanta grinned with delight. Yup, dinner time was lively. That night, Andrew decided to take a bath. According to Ching, there was a hot spring for everyone in the temple, and a private hot spring in the temple for Ching, Hibika, and Aya. Andrew walked down the hall, holding a towel, a washcloth, and soap bar in his hands. For five minutes, he searched aimlessly for the hot spring, passing the public hot spring several times. Finally, Andrew found it located near the dining room on the east side of the temple. There was a large door with the words, For the Royal Family, written in Japanese. Andrew looked at the door before walking in. The changing room was very large. Andrew quickly took off his clothes and placed the towel around him. He stepped out of the changing room and into the enclosed hot spring. The hot spring stood in the center, with tiled floor surrounding it. Just above him was a very high glass ceiling, and the stony walls added a nice touch. There was even a stone divider, separating the hot spring. The place seemed empty. Andrew approached the steamy water. Suddenly, the water began to bubble. Andrew stopped to examine the bubbles. With a splash, Ibika rose out of the water. Her voluptuous body exposed every blue spot she had to him. Andrew's eyes widened and his nose bled. Oh my god, Andrew managed to say. Ibika screamed as she covered herself in the water. Get out, you pervert! I didn't mean... Andrew started, but was hit in the forehead with Hibika's soap bar. Andrew fell backwards, crashing to the ground with a huge red lump on his forehead. Hibika clapped her hands, calling for the servant girls. 
They came and immediately carried Andrew, who was still dazed, back into his room. A shadowy figure sneaked down the hall and had picked the lock in Mark's room. They got into Mark's bed, with Mark sleeping in it. Mark turned over, holding the person in his arms with a smile on his face. The next morning, Andrew woke up in his bed with a headache. That girl can throw, he said rubbing his bruised forehead. Andrew got out of bed. He went to Mark's room. Andrew rapped on the door. The door slowly opened with each rap. That's odd, thought Andrew as he looked around the room. Mark slowly woke up. He was shirtless. He saw Andrew standing by the door. How'd you get in here, Drew? He asked, rubbing his eyes. The door was unlocked, answered Andrew. That's impossible, replied Mark, placing his right hand on the other side of the bed. I know I... Mark gently tapped the bed with his right hand. He felt a body. Oh Mark jumped up, holding onto the chandelier. It was clear to Andrew that Mark slept only in his underwear. Andrew pulled the covers off the bed. Andrew freaked oh when he God! saw Aya sleeping in Mark's bed. At least her nightgown was still on. I didn't do nothing, replied Mark, who was still hanging onto the chandelier. I don't do kitty love, yo. Suddenly, Aya woke up as her left nightgown Ooh. strap fell off her shoulder. Good morning, Andrew. Where's my lover? Andrew pointed to the ceiling. How the hell did you get in my room? Mark asked. I picked the lock. She answered with a smile. Nothing can come between us. Dude, she's got a major crush on you. Replied Andrew. He started to <laughs> crack up. Not funny, Drew. Said Mark. Suddenly, Hibika entered the room. Oh yeah. What are you doing in here? I wanted to stay with my lover. Answered Aya. Why do you want to stay with him? Ibika asked, pointing at Andrew. Not him, replied Aya. She quickly pointed at Mark. Him. Mark is the sexiest guy I've seen in my life, and I want to marry him. This is what I get for being sexy, Mark said sarcastically. Aya, Mark is an earthling who probably has a lover on Earth, replied Ibika. You can't marry him. So what? I uh, shot back. It is destiny that brought us together. You can't defy destiny. If you will excuse me, I'm going to take a bath. I uh, winked at Mark and headed for the hot spring. That child has some serious issues, replied Mark. Poor Mark, said Shanta, who came out of her room. Can't even handle a little crush. Shout out Shanta, Mark exclaimed. The chandelier hinges came apart, and he crashed onto his bed. After breakfast, Ching told Shanta, Mark and Andrew that today began their training, and they would be trained under Master Dao. Ching said he would teach them animism. Learning it would take months, but they were ready for the challenge. It seems our heroes are getting used to the Nebtans. But will they survive the training this Master Dao has planned for them? You'll have to wait in the next episode of Beast of the Bronx. Yeah. Intuition, just wanna follow intuition All my senses tell me I know what you've been thinking I know, I know. I've been feeling, what if we got up, left this party Cause I can see you probably gonna be scrolling feeds all night long Your friends are drunk And the DJ keeps playing the same songs And time isn't moving along so would it be cool to say Do you wanna escape without ending the night? We could drive through all of the city lights Or we could find a two-star place Just you and I That'd be nice oh, Do you want to escape with me? Oh, oh. 
What is it, Lord? Yes, I'm sharing with the audience the stories within the Book of Heroes. Oh no, I thought Michael and Raphael intercepted her. They failed. I see. Then, it's up to your chosen warriors to take up the mantle once more. Are they ready to fight again?